the stalks for this portion, they help anchor my cerebrum to that brain stem, where it almost looks like it gets to sit on that area. Okay, sort of, but not. All right. <coughs> this time, they point out that we have what's called the red nuclei. The only reason to note that, if you hear that term, red nucleus, they're letting you know it has an extreme blood flow. There is a very high <coughs> blood flow to those nuclei. We're going to find that there are some terms associated. The substantia nigra, once again, referring to those particular nuclei. But look what we get. Connections between the thalamus and then something called basal nuclei. In our bodies, under normal conditions, in these areas of the brain, because of the connections that exist, and especially because of the connections that can exist with my cerebellum, these nuclei, they work to keep, for the most part, body movements smooth. Not jerky or difficult or anything like that. Okay, that kind of looked like the dancing off the sound too. What was her name? Oh, Elaine. Elaine. Okay. Keeping the body movements smooth. All right. Our cerebellum plays a huge role in that. So I get to have in areas of basal nuclei and the thalamus the ability to help keep body movements smooth. They believe that research is showing that these areas where we find basal nuclei, their degeneration is leading to the muscle tremors of stuff like Parkinson's disease. And if you know anyone who's ever had Parkinson's disease, it's horrible. You know, it really is. Um, we're going to find that we're going to have fibers that will help connect the cerebrum to the pons. So if we're at this point right here, I still need to have a connection between my cerebrum and the pons just below it. All right? So we'll have some fibers go through that midbrain to do that. And then, of course, the cerebral aqueduct, which they're trying to show with this little indentation right here going to the cerebellum. They're trying to show that as the cerebral aqueduct. Do we kind of see that? So, <clears throat> in these areas, because we do find that particular formation, like I was saying, it looks like this structure that will go across, okay? It doesn't really look like a web to me, but in some, yeah, they, they tend to say a web, um, but it looks to me more like it does this branching that can occur. So, the neural networks that we find, for the reticular formation, look at the stuff that they are now seeing associated with the reticular formation. Somatic motor control, they are finding it helps maintain muscle tone. If you remember, 
our skeletal muscle had to keep a little bit of electricity so that when we needed to move, it was ready to move. So they're finding it uh, related to that, which of course helps with balance and posture. Like we said, the cardiac center, monitoring what's taking place, giving the information about a heartbeat so that, remember, nervous system doesn't control the heartbeat, but it will affect it. Meaning, to meet the body's demand, it can say speed up or slow down for the heartbeat. Pain modulation. In this area of the brain, where we're going to have the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain, we have our analgesic pathways. Now, analgesic pathways. What do we think of when I hear that term, analgesic? I'm thinking like Tylenol and Bleed and Aspirin and stuff like that. Believe it, huh? When you take medications like the Tylenol and stuff like that, it just simply, at a certain point of the, the spinal cord, it just blocks the pain. It doesn't really do anything to help cure or anything. It just blocks the signal from getting to the brain. That's why you have to keep taking it. But we're going to learn. Our body has the ability to create analgesics. They, what the body creates is 100, I think it's 100 times stronger than morphine. If you've ever had morphine, then you know that's strong, okay? And it gets released in times of extreme stress or trauma. All right, so this is where it comes into play that like somebody, um, well, you know, like if they are involved in some type of accident or war or anything like that and, and you know, in the fighting and everything, they might be shot and not know it until everything is done, okay? Because their body is in such high stress that they don't even know that the injury has occurred until their body begins to calm down, okay? So we have in our body the ability to do that, but at the same time, this would be an area that we would think of as like, okay, well, if I have a, my arm hurts and I took some Tylenol, okay, the hope is that it'll block that signal going up that pathway. That's the hope. For sleep and consciousness, it's affecting the projections for that, okay? For our ability to be conscious, alert, or asleep. Habituation. This is one I've been waiting to talk about. Okay. How many of you at this point in time right now feel your toes and your shoes? I do now. You do now. Because I mentioned it. But in a few seconds, it's not going to bother you again. Unless I mention the toes and the shoe again. Because. When we talk about the amount of information that has to go into the brain, there is no way that I can even begin to explain the amount of information the body is monitoring. Because we're, most of the time, not even aware. The body, the brain goes, oh, okay, yeah, that's the level of light. I don't need to keep moving her pupils. Oh, that's a background sound. I don't need to keep making her aware of that. Oh, she's sitting in a chair. I don't need to keep making her aware of that. It's 
has the ability to ignore the repetitive stimuli, which is kind of cool. And then it has something called the reticular activating system. This is where it's affecting information in our cerebral cortex, stuff that we are consciously doing or aware of. You know, like you might be sitting there holding your pen, waiting to write something, but you're not paying constant attention to that. You know, but the body's going to be aware and that sort of thing. So this particular formation, they're continuing to learn a lot of information about it, um, probably new stuff every day. One thing about the brain and the spinal cord and the nerves and everything, this is not an area that the information is always death to be all end all. Okay? Because we are constantly learning new information about the brain and the spinal cord. So now, if we look at that largest part, the cerebellum, which we've really held in our hands, looked at, that sort of thing. But, huge area, right? All right. Does it really do a lot? Answer to that yes and no. Only if you answer it, well, in comparison to what? Does it do a lot in comparison to the cerebellum? Not by any stretch of the imagination. Does it do a lot in comparison to this area of the brain stem? No, not a lot. Does it do a lot in comparison to a car on the road? Yeah. Okay. Just depends on what you compare it to. So, it has that right and left hemisphere. They're connected by what's termed the vermis. When we begin to look at this structure, um, oh, wait a minute, y'all. I looked at the wrong part. Y'all are going to be like, huh, what? I was saying stuff about the cerebrum, not the cerebellum. Y'all should have caught that. Whew. I automatically went to the large part of the brain. No. Sorry. My mistake. We're going to correct that cerebellum. When we look at this, yes. Talk about busy. Okay, this one is busier than the cerebrum. I don't, my brain kind of went off on a different track. So, folds, folia. Okay, remember how I mentioned the arbavita? Okay, there's our arbavita. Now, anything that goes through this area, it will go to the cortex. Output comes from nuclei because you're going to, I think in your, in your textbook or either the lab manual, I can't remember which one, it'll kind of show you how deep nuclei are, which are areas of dense nerve cell bodies. But look at this. Contains over half of our brain neurons. This one area contains over half, and I wrote the number down because I wanted to make sure I put that number in, and over half has over a hundred billion neurons in that portion of the brain. It gets connected to the brain stem. Once again, some stalks. And once again, the textbook's going to get into great detail. But they're <clears> simply <throat> called 
peduncles. 